The God's Peculiar People podcast presents recording of the life of D.L. Moody by his son, William R. Moody. The Life of D.L. Moody, Chapter 24, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, and New York. How is it that while you and other like men are all but inaccessible, fenced in by closed doors and guarded by polite but immovable private secretaries, Dwight L. Moody sees you at any time, was asked of a certain prominent financier. He is one of us, was the reply. From the very first of his evangelistic work in America, Mr. Moody's sound judgment inspired the confidence of men of affairs. While his loyalty to the gospel in all its simplicity, without championing theological fads, recommended him to the ministers who believed in evangelistic efforts, he also earned the support of laymen who were able to give him the opportunity for large enterprises. This had been demonstrated in the work in Great Britain, and on his return to his own country, the same general support was afforded in the larger American cities, which had extended to him the heartiest invitations. These invitations were readily accepted, for, as Mr. Moody expressed it, water runs downhill, and the highest hills in America are the great cities. If we can stir them, we shall stir the whole country. The first American campaign was begun in Brooklyn, October 1875. Preparations had been made for these meetings, not only by providing places of assemblage and arranging a program for the exercises, but by the union of various denominations in holding meetings for prayer and conference, and pledging one another to a cordial cooperation in the effort of the evangelist, upon whose work in Great Britain the divine blessing had so signally rested. A rink was engaged for a month, and chairs for 5,000 persons were provided. As the interest in the services grew, greater efforts were put forth to reach more people by increasing the number of meetings. The help of local ministers and prominent laymen was enlisted, and overflow meetings and special services in churches and halls widened the scope of the work. The influence of the mission extended beyond Brooklyn, the New York Tribune, commenting editorially on the work, said, There is a common-sense view to be taken in this matter, as of every other. In the first place, why should we sneer because a large part of the multitudes crowding into the Brooklyn rink are drawn there only by curiosity? So they were when they followed Christ into the streets of Jerusalem or the wilderness yet they went to the healing of their souls. Or, that a still larger part already profess Christianity, and believe all that Moody and Zanke teach, there is not one of them who will not be the better for a little quickening of his faith, and we may add, of his movements too. In the second place, with regard to the men themselves, there can, we think, be but one opinion as to their sincerity. They are not money-makers, they are not charlatans. Decorous, conservative England, which reprobated both their work and the manner of it, held them in the full blaze of scrutiny for months, and could not detect in them a single motive which was not pure. Earnest and sincere men are rare in these days. Is it not worth our while to give to them a dispassionate, unprejudiced hearing? Thirdly, in regard to their message, they preach no new doctrine, no dogma of this or that sect, nothing but Christ and the necessity among us of increased zeal in his service. Which of us will controvert that truth? If the Christian religion is not the one hope for our individual and social life, what is? And lastly, with regard to the method of these men in presenting Christ in his teaching, men of high culture or exceptional sensitiveness of taste shrink from the familiarity of words and ideas in which a subject they hold as revered and sublime beyond expression is set forth to the crowd. They call it vulgarizing and debasing the truth, granting that their own opinion is right from their point of view, what is to be done with the crowd? They cannot all be men of fine culture or exceptional sensitiveness. They are not moved to believe or trust in Christ through philosophic arguments, or contemplation of nature, or logical conviction, or appeals to their aesthetic senses, by classical music, stained glass, or church architecture. They are plain, busy people, with ordinary minds and taste. Yet, certainly, as Christ died to save them, it is necessary that they should be brought to him by some means, and persuaded to live cleaner, higher, more truthful lives. Christianity is not a matter of grammar for libraries and drawing rooms, refined taste or delicate sensibility. It was not to the cultured classes that Christ himself preached, but to the working people, the publicans, fishermen, tax gatherers, and he used the words and illustrations which would appeal to them most forcibly. If Mr. Moody and Sankey or any other teachers bring him directly home to men's convictions and lead them to amend their lives for his sake, let us thank God for the preacher and let his taste and grammar take care of themselves. In Philadelphia, a no less notable series of meetings was conducted in the recently abandoned freight depot of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which has since become the widely known Wanamaker Store. This building was provided with seats to accommodate 13,000 persons and otherwise adapted to the needs of a large mission hall. Here, as in Brooklyn, the leaders and ministers gave their hearty support to the work and in every way expressed their approval of the effort. 
Separate meetings for different classes of hearers were started early in the week. Mr. Moody said that he was going to have a meeting for young men, limited to those under 40, as that would just take him in his 40th birthday was celebrated near the close of the campaign. One meeting was set apart especially for intemperate men and women. At Mr. Moody's request, a large number of people who had been regularly attending the meeting remained away, that their seats might be occupied by those for whom the meeting was especially designed. The audience has been described as follows by a witness. Here and there could be seen the bloated faces of bleary-eyed drunkards, glancing wildly around, as though the strangeness of the situation was so overpowering that it required a great effort of will to remain. Not a few were accompanied by mothers, wives, sisters, or friends, who, having exhausted human means, had determined to lay their burden upon the Lord. The great majority of those gathered in the depot tabernacle yesterday afternoon were a sad-faced and tearful collection of humanity, as it would be possible to assemble in one place. Those who without directly suffered by intemperance grew at once in sympathy with the hundreds of those whose heavy sighs told stories of unutterable anguish, and this influence increased until a cloud of terrible depression seemed to hang over the entire congregation. Every class of society was represented in this throng, united so closely by such painful bonds. Close to the half-starved, long-abused, yet faithful wife of some besotted brute was seated the child of fortune and culture, child no more, but an old, old woman, whose only son, still in his youth, had fallen almost to the lowest depths of degradation. Next to her was a man whose every feature showed nobility of soul and rare talents, but whose threadbare coat and sunken cheeks betrayed him to all observers as the lifelong victim of an unconquerable appetite. Just behind the group was a young girl whose face, sweet as an angel's, was already furred by grief. Beside her was her father, who, broken down in health and almost ruined in mind by the excessive use of liquor, seemed at last to have resigned himself to hopeless ruin. He gazed about in a half-sleep, half-childish way, and several times attempted to get up and leave his seat. But the hand of the child woman held his very tightly, and each time he would conquer his restlessness and sit down. By far the larger proportion of the congregation were women. Almost all of them had evidently, clutching at their hearts, the agonizing image of some past or present experience, with woe in its most terrible form. It was interesting to see the change that gradually came of the audience, as Mr. Moody declared over and over again that the God who had once cast down devils could do it then, and would do it if only asked. And as fervent prayers for immediate help were offered, the clouds seemed to rise from their hearts, while the noonday sun poured upon them its blessed rays of hope, and eyes long dimmed by tears beamed with a new light. Among the laymen who were prominent in this work were John Winnemaker and George H. Stewart. Mr. Wainermaker's special meetings for young men were largely attended at this time. As on former occasions, Mr. Moody observed the closing of the old year with a special service, which Mr. Henry Clay Trumbull thus described. The central figure on the platform that New Year's Eve was one whose appearance and bearing was most impressive, the Reverend Dr. William S. Plummer, then a professor of the Columbia Theological Seminary in South Carolina, and who nearly forty years before was a moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church was a figure that would compel reverence and regard in any gathering. Massive in frame, towering in stature, venerable in appearance, with snowy hair and flowing beard, he suggested Michelangelo's Moses. Mr. Moody was on this occasion represented not as the teacher, but as the inquirer. Mr. Plummer stood out as the teacher, to whom the younger Moody came with his questions of heart. Few men, if any, in the world better knew the anxious cravings and doubts of the inquiring soul than Moody, as he had met with them in his varied evangelistic labors. Few trained theologians could have more wisely and simply answered those inquirers than the large-brained, large-hearted, large-framed, venerable patriarch before whom Moody stood. The whole scene evidenced the simplicity of trust in God as the sinner came to him through Jesus Christ, in his need and in his confidence. The theologian could answer the question that the anxious soul longed for. Mr. Moody and Dr. Plummer were as one in this interview. A few specimen questions and answers will illustrate. Mr. Moody. Is any given amount of distress necessary to genuine conversion? Dr. Plummer. Lydia had no distress. We read of none. God opened her heart, and she attended to the things spoken by Paul. But the jailer of Philippi would not have accepted Christ without some alarm. If you will accept the Son of God, you need have no trouble. There's nothing in trouble that sanctifies the soul. Mr. Moody. Well, doctor, what is conversion? Dr. Plummer. Glory to be to God. There is such a thing as conversion. To be converted is to turn from self, self-will, self-righteousness, all self-confidence, and from sin itself, and to be turned to Christ. Mr. Moody. Can a man be saved here tonight, before twelve o'clock? Saved all at once? Dr. Plummer. Why not? In my Bible I read of three thousand men gathered together one morning, all of them murderers, their hands stained with the blood of the Son of God. 
They met in the morning, and before night they were all baptized members of Christ. Mr. Moody, how can I know that I am saved? Dr. Plummer, because of the fact that God is true. Let God be true, but every man a liar. If I accept Jesus Christ, it is not Mr. Moody's word, nor Mr. Sankey's, nor Dr. Newton's. It is the word of the living God, whose name is Amen. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Mr. Moody, what if I haven't got faith enough? Dr. Plummer, glory to God. If I can touch the hem of my Savior's garment, I should be saved. A little faith is as truly faith as a great deal of faith. A little coal of fire in the ashes is as truly fire as the glowing heat of a furnace. Mr. Moody, I don't feel that I love Christ enough. Dr. Plummer, and you never will. To all eternity, you will never love him as much as he deserves to be loved. Had I ten thousand tongues, not one should silent be. Had I ten thousand hearts, I'd give them all to thee. As the hour of midnight approached, the appeals of Mr. Moody, following his illustrative inquiry meeting, grew more and more earnest, and the solemnity of the service deepened. Just before twelve o'clock, he asked all present to join in silent prayer. While all heads were still bowed, the profound silence was broken by Mr. Sankey's singing of Almost Persuaded. Then the closing moments of the passing year were given to earnest prayer, especially for those who had risen to ask for it at Mr. Moody's call, and were now urged to a final decision. When at midnight, the sounding out of the bell of Independence Hall was the signal for all the bells of the city and the steam whistles on every side to greet the incoming year. Mr. Moody wished all a happy new year, and that never-to-be-forgotten watch-night service closed. Its echoes are still resounding in many hearts on earth and in heaven, and their gratitude is now deeper than ever to dear Mr. Moody and his fellow workers on that sacred occasion. The late George H. Stewart thus spoke of the Philadelphia meeting a few weeks after their close. In October last, we attempted a great work for God in our city. Some had high expectations that it would redound largely to the glory of heaven. They saw a deep spirit of prayer among the clergymen and members of the churches. And what has been the result? It has far exceeded the highest hopes of the most sanguine. We had little thought to see a hall filled to overflowing day after day, with from 7,000 to 13,000 people who came to hear the old, old story of Jesus and his love. God heard our prayer, and his work has been continued in all our churches. In my own church, an old Scottish church, which has been little dispossessed to unity in such religious movements, I have seen what I have never seen before during 40 years that I have known it. At the morning meetings in the depot church, and on Sundays, the early hour at which people come was remarkable. The watchman told me that he saw men gathering there as early as 4.30 a.m., and at six o'clock on cold mornings in January, the throng was so great that he was obliged to open the doors. My church has had two pastors in 75 years. On Sunday next, it will hold a special communion service, something it has not known in years, and 25 new communicants will be there. Two-thirds of them are young men. During the Philadelphia mission, a number of Princeton students attended the evangelistic meetings and were greatly impressed. Returning to their college, they began working for an invitation to Mr. Moody to come and preach to the students. The work inaugurated at that time developed later into organizations that have continued fruitfully not only among American students, but throughout the world. The last notable mission of that winter was conducted in New York. At a meeting of the clergymen and laymen in June 1875, while Mr. Moody was still in London, a temporary organization was formed, of which the late Reverend Dr. John Hall was chairman. By the unanimous vote of all present, a cordial invitation was extended to the evangelist to hold a series of religious meetings in New York, as soon as their engagements would permit. On the acceptance of this invitation, a permanent organization was formed, and careful preparations were made for the proposed meetings. William E. Dodge was president of the General Committee, George H. Andrews, Bulls Colgate, and Henry Oakley, vice presidents, and of more than 30 clergymen, representing nearly all the Protestant denominations and as many laymen, were members of the committee. The executive committee consisted of Nathan Bishop, chairman, John H. Havemeyer, secretary, and William E. Dodge, Jr., the Reverend Dr. S. Irenaeus Prime, S. B. Schifflin, Elliot F. Shepard, Morris K. Jessup, and R. R. McBurney. The committee obtained a lease of the Hippodrome on the site of the present Madison Square Garden at Madison Avenue and 4th Avenue, between 26th and 27th Streets, as the most central and suitable building for the meetings. The auditorium was divided into two large halls, each capable of seating about 7,000 persons, and a call was issued by the committee for a private guarantee fund to meet attendant expenses. In the call it was stated that it must be distinctly understood that Messrs. Moody and Sankey refused to receive any payment for their own services, thus no part of the above fund would be paid to them. While the committee was attending to the business details, Christian people were not idle in the churches. There was an increased interest in meetings for prayer and religious conference. 
The daily prayer meeting uptown at Lyric Hall was largely attended, while the Fulton Street meeting held the fresh impulse of revival preparations. Again, the same hearty cooperation and unity of the pastors of the leading churches were experienced, and the sympathy on the part of the churches found expression in the denominational papers. The New York Observer thus voiced the sentiment of the Presbyterians. The men who have been invited to New York have given full proof of their efficient ministry by their labors in other places, and our pastors know whom they are addressing when they ask their aid. These evangelists have been proved by the ministers and churches, who, of all others, were most likely to condemn them if their doctrines and measures had not been in harmony with the word of God, and approved by sound judgment. They have been in the midst of the most orthodox and well-instructed religious communities in Great Britain. Excellent, learned, thoughtful pastors, and most eminent laymen, statesmen, jurists, and bankers have attended their meetings and given their favorable opinion in writing. Presbyterians, general assemblies, dignitaries in the Church of England, and officers under government, men who are not emotional or enthusiastic, who are the furthest removed from religious fanaticism, testify to the great value of the labors of these evangelists. Their discourses have been published and widely read by those who disapprove of such labors, as well as by their audiences. I have found no fault to them, is the general verdict. They are simple, scriptural calls to the unconverted. God has followed them with his blessing, and has made them useful in turning sinners from their wicked ways, and in bringing them to Christ. We have also personal testimony from wise men, who have been on the ground after the evangelists have been away for a year, and they assure us that the work of grace goes forward, with no unhappy reaction, and with every evidence of continued good. The papers, secular and religious, publish long accounts of the meetings, in some instances giving verbatim reports of the addresses. The following vivid description of an early Sunday morning service is from the pen of William Hoyt Coleman. It is ten minutes after seven, and at the Madison Avenue entrance there is a compact crowd extending to the curbside, awaiting the opening of the doors for the eight o'clock lecture. A well-dressed, good-humored crowd that stamps his feet and chats pleasantly. One or two men are giving tickets to those who have come unprovided. Across the street a lady is accosting several rough-looking young fellows, apparently inviting them to the meeting, but without success. Five minutes later, a door slides back, a gratified ah goes up, and the crowd moves in, slowly, as the door is partly opened. Through a wide passage we emerge into a space filled with chairs, surrounded by a low gallery, backed by a huge white board partition, and overhung by an arched roof, broken by many skylights. A high K-shaped platform runs from one gallery to the other, along the white partition. At its center is a railed projection for the speaker and his assistants, the rails running back to the partition, where there is a doorway with a crimson screen. The right-hand section of the platform holds a melodeon and the choir, the left-hand section the special ticket holders. The hall is nearly full, a mixed assemblage of all classes, some very poor, a few not very clean. Many black faces dot the congregation. A large part of these present are evidently Sunday school teachers. One wonders how so many of them came at so early an hour. A man nearby says, I built a fire and got my own breakfast. At 7.40, the choir begins to sing and the congregation joins in. Nearly all have brought their little hymn books, and the tunes being simple and spirited, they sing in good time. Promptly at eight o'clock, two men take their places, one within the rail, the other at the melodeon. As the former rises, after a moment of silent prayer, you see a short, stout-built, square-shouldered man, with a bullet-shaped head set close to the shoulders, black eyes that twinkle merrily at times, and a full but not heavy beard and mustache. The face expresses fun, good humor, persistence. The coat is closely buttoned, with a bit of stand-up collar seen over it. Such is Yamudi, the leader of the Hippodrome work. As he stands with hands resting on the rail, you are conscious that it is to see, not to be seen. Like an engineer with his hand on the throttle, like a physician with his hand on the patient's pulse, his mind is on the work before him. A quick, soldierly bearing marks every movement. He gives out a hymn so rapidly that we scarce catch the words, and then we look at Sankey, a man of larger build, clean-cut features, and shaven chin. A voice clear, melodious, and powerful. Easier and, gentle and bear easier and gentler in bearing than Moody, he has enough force and fire in speech and song to hold an audience in perfect quiet. And when he sings alone, you hear every word, and catch from face and voice the full meaning of the song. Both men impress you as honest and good, hearty and wholesome in body and mind, and thoroughly in earnest. After the hymns and a prayer comes a solo by Mr. Sankey, and then Mr. Moody lectures on Jacob. Headlong talking would better describe it. His voice is rough, pitched on one key, and he speaks straight before him, rarely turning to the side. But how real he makes the men! How visibly the deceiving, scheming Jacob stands before us, 
and how pointedly he applies the lessons of the patriarch's life to the men and women before him. His gestures are few but emphatic, the hand flung forcibly forward with palm open, both hands brought down, hammer-like with closed fist. But the Bible is too much in his hands to allow frequent gestures. He continually refers to it, reads from it, and keeps it open on the stand beside him. His sermon, or lecture, is little more than an exposition of a Bible truth, or a dramatic rendering of a Bible story, with continuous application to his hearers. There is an occasional slip of speech, done for did, come for came, Israel, etc. But the Bible knowledge, experience of life, and dead earnestness of the speaker sweep every petty criticism out of sight. Though under full headway, he sees all that happens. Towards the close of the sermon, a rough young man comes down the aisle, going straight up to the platform steps. Usher will take care of that case, interjects Mr. Moody, and goes quietly on. He ends abruptly, prays briefly, pronounces the benediction, and when you lift your head, he is gone. By the same keen observer, a no less interesting description is given of an evening service. Imagine yourself on the platform at the Madison Avenue Hall at 7.15 p.m., five minutes before the opening of the doors. Platform and near gallery are already well filled by the choir, Christian workers, and their escorts, and special ticket holders. The floor of the house is unoccupied, save by knots of ushers with their wands, no one being allowed to sit there until the doors are opened. In the railed enclosure, just back of the speaker's place, is a telegraph operator, usually a lady. Nearby sits the chief superintendent, with aides at hand to transmit orders. At the other end of the hall sit another superintendent and operator. These control the lighting and heating and the seating of the audience. Ting, 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 goes a distant bell ten times. Attention. Ting, ting, again, and the outer and inner doors slip back at three points, and three streams of people pour into the hall. The foremost enter at a run that would become a disorder did not the usher check it, divide the stream, direct it into the front and middle seats, and when a section is filled, bar the way with his wand. In ten minutes, five thousand persons are seated. The galleries fill more slowly, and when all parts are full, the doors are closed, and no one is allowed to stand in the aisles or along the gallery front save a few blue-coated policemen, whose services seem rarely called for. The half-hour before meeting time passes quickly. One steadies the vast throng before him with an ceasing interest. The bright light of the many reflectors falls full upon the faces of all sorts and conditions of men, to say nothing of women and children. A more mixed multitude would be hard to find. At the four o'clock meeting, women are the lead element, next to old people, some of them so feeble as to almost be carried to the seats. But at night, all classes and ages are present. There is a quiet stir elsewhere, but no noise or levity. At 7.45, Mr. Thatcher leads the choir in singing and shows great skill in managing both choir and congregation, in combined and separate parts, and in providing tender and powerful effects. One reason is he has capital music to do it with. The Moody and Sankey hymn book is the best for congregational use ever printed. Its words are full of the gospel. Its tune express the thoughts they are allied to, and are so simple and yet positive in character that anyone can sing them after once hearing them. When this vast congregation sings safe in the arms of Jesus, or I hear thy welcome voice, one gets a new idea of the power of sacred song. Eight o'clock, and Mr. Moody is at his post. It is a pleasant night, and though every seat is filled, there is a large crowd outside. Announcing a hymn, he says, Now, won't a thousand of you Christians go into the Fourth Avenue Hall and pray for these meetings, and let those outside have your seats? Here is a practical application for Christian self-denial, not pleasant to those who have fought for good seats. However, a few go out. Not half enough, says Mr. Moody at the end of the first verse. I want a great many more to go out. I see many of you here every night, and if I knew your names, I'd call them out. So after much urging, quite a number leave, the doors are opened, and the empty seats are filled again. The platform does not escape. Now some of you go, and a few retire. Will the ushers please open the windows, is the next order. Mr. Moody is autocratic in his demands for fresh air. Fresh air is as important as the sermon, he says. We've got to keep these people awake, and they're half asleep already. All very true, but opening the top back window throws cruel drafts in the galleries, so it wasn't long before the windows are shut, and very soon Mr. Moody is calling for fresh air again. How he preaches has already been described. The evening sermon is usually of a bolder, offhand character than that of the afternoon, which is intended more especially for Christians. He makes a marked distinction between preaching the gospel and teaching Christians. His afternoon sermon on the Holy Spirit seemed meant for himself as well as for others, and at the close his voice trembled with emotion as he said, I want more of this power. Pray for me that I may be filled with the Holy Spirit when coming to this platform, that men may feel I come with a message from God. The quiet of the audience during Moody's preaching and Sankey's singing is quite remarkable. Even the rough young fellows who crowd the gallery passages make no sound. 
At the close, Mr. Moody announces a men's meeting in the other hall, a boys' meeting in one of the smaller rooms, and the usual work in the inquiry meeting. Those attending these meetings are requested to go to them while the last hymn is being sung. The Hippodrome work is a vast business enterprise, organized and conducted by businessmen, who have put money into it on business principles, for the purpose of saving men. But through all the machinery vibrates the power, without which it would be useless, the power of the Holy Ghost. Of course it is successful. Men are being saved day and night, and a moral influence is felt round about the building itself. Two Sundays ago, the police returns of that precinct showed no arrest, a thing before unknown. And a recent statement says that in spite of the increased destitution among the poor this winter, there has been no increase of crime. Christians have been warmed, lumbered up, and taught to work as they have never worked before. Taught how to study their Bible, and how to use them for the good of others. How to reach men simply, naturally, and successfully. How to live consistently and wholeheartedly themselves. Easy-going church life of multitudes has been sharply rebuked by these laborious evangelists. Worshipping in the rude-walled hippodrome, sitting on wooden chairs, led in song by a man with a melodeon, and preached to by a man without a pulpit, they have learned that costly churches, stained windows, soft cushions, great organs, and quartet choirs are not necessary to the worship of God, and tend to drive away the poor, leaving the rich to enjoy their luxuries alone. Congregational singing has received a great impetus. The little moody and sangy hymn book is crowding out the bulky collection of 1,200 and 1,400 hymns, some of them one-third unsingable and one-third padding, containing only pieces, new and old, that the people can sing. The people have found it out, and are singing them all over the land, and beyond seas, in Europe, Asia, and Africa, until five million copies and twenty different translations give some idea of the popularity of this little book. With it goes a new idea, that of singing the gospel, for many of these pieces are not hymns at all, but simple gospel songs, and they have been the means of converting many souls. Ministers of the Gospel have freely acknowledged that Mr. Moody has taught them valuable lessons in their own work, how to make Bible truths and Bible characters more real, how to use the Bible more freely in preaching instead of taking a text for a peg on which to hang their own ideas, how to bring the truth into close contact with all sorts of people and make it stick, how to set old Christians and young converts to work, and the whole church is now giving heed to Mr. Moody's idea about church debts, church fairs, church choirs, and other supposedly necessary evils of modern church life. Mr. Moody's wisdom in accepting invitations to the largest American cities was immediately apparent, for the interest awakened in Philadelphia and New York gave him entrance into still larger fields of service. The support of the large secular papers of the East greatly added to his influence in every effort in Christian work in later years. Although in some quarters the tendency was to refer slightingly to the meetings, many able correspondents expressed their sympathy worth the work even if they did not accept the message that was given. In the Hippodrome, Mr. Moody has gathered day by day the largest audiences ever seen in this city, said one of the ablest of the secular journalists. Lawyers, bankers, merchants, some of whom scarcely ever enter a church, are just as much a part of his congregation as are the second-rate and third-rate boarding-house people, mentioned so conspicuously in a recently published analysis. All classes and conditions of men have been represented in these great revival meetings. Mr. Moody is a man of such persistent consistency that it is scarcely more possible that he should change himself than, to use, about, to use a biblical figure, a leopard should change his spots. Indeed, there is no prospect that he will ever conform himself or his style to the demands of propriety or to the requirements of grammatical rules. Let us frankly confess, as we bid him goodbye, that we are heartily glad that he is what he is. We would not change him. Make him the best read preacher in the world, and he would instantly lose half his power. He is just right for his work as he is, original, dashing, careless. Mr. Moody reaches the masses more surely and widely because he is one of them himself, and because he has not been more eloquent and faultless by the trimming and restraining process of liberal education. His familiarity and conversational manner please them. They like his directness and earnestness. He is driving a bargain with them, and he talks sense. He is trying to comfort them from the world's bitter wind they are seeking refuge. And he fills their souls with the assurance of a father's love. There they sit and listen, the poor, the distressed, the afflicted, the sorrowful, taking their fill of deep and liquid rest, forgetful of all ill. Life becomes pleasanter to them. The future assumes a hopeful aspect. Mr. Moody touches more chords than the ordinary preacher on Sunday. He comes nearer home. He nourishes them more. His society is more refreshing. They go away from the Hippodrome brightened and strengthened. They like Mr. Moody, and so does almost everybody. Hence, we would not on any account have him change himself. 
We enjoy his rude simplicity and his pell-mell earnestness, his downright individuality and his uncalculating naturalness. An interesting incident occurring at this time is related by Professor George P. Fisher of the Yale Divinity School, as illustrating Mr. Moody's sincerity and courageous frankness as well as his kindness. Says Professor Fisher, I once passed an evening company with Mr. Thurlow Weed, who was long a leader in the politics of New York, and in the Civil War was sent abroad on a kind of unofficial embassy to confer with men of power in England. In the course of a long conversation, Mr. Weed asked if I knew Mr. Moody, and added that Mr. Moody wrote him an excellent letter, which he would like me to read. It was an acknowledgment of a very generous contribution for Mr. Weed to defray the expenses of the meetings held in New York. Mr. Weed did not himself mention the occasion of the letter, but he afterwards sent me a copy of it. This is the letter. Mr. Weed, my dear friend, yours of the 20th of March with check came to hand yesterday. I am at a loss to know what to do. I am afraid you may put it with some other good deeds, and they may keep you from coming to Christ as a lost sinner. I wish you knew how anxious I am for you, and how I long to see you out and out on the Lord's side. I thank you for the money. But what would you say if I should treat your rewards as you have the gift of God, and send it back to you? Would you not be offended? Now, as I take your gift, will you not take God's gift and let us rejoice together? I cannot bear to leave the city and leave you out of the ark that God has provided for you and all the rest of us. Hoping to hear soon of your conversion, I remain your friend and brother, I hope in Christ, D.L. Moody. When the meeting was in progress, the tablet, a Roman Catholic paper, devoted two columns and one issue to the work of the evangelist, saying in its review, This work of Mr. Moody is not a sin. It cannot be sent to invite men to love and serve Jesus Christ. It is irregular, unauthorized, but it may be bringing multitudes to a happier frame of mind, in which the church may find them better prepared to receive her sublime faith. Whatever philosophical skeptics may say, said the New York Times, the work accomplished this winter by Mr. Moody in the city for private and public morals will live. The drunken have become sober, the vicious virtuous, the worldly and self-seeking unselfish, the ignoble noble, the impure pure, the youth has started with some generous aims. The old have been stirred from grossness. A new hope has lifted up hundreds of human beings. A new consolation has come to the sorrowful, and a better principle has entered the sordid life of the day through the labors of these plain men. Whatever the prejudice may say against them, the honest-minded and just will not forget their labors of love. Years after this series of meetings was ended, it was not an uncommon question for the critics to ask, Where are the converts of the Hippodrome? Without making any effort to investigate the matter themselves, they demanded data forthwith from those who expressed their confidence in the efficacy of the special evangelistic effort. The Christians in many of the churches in New York and other cities who first made their profession of faith at these meetings have no distinguishing mark by which they could at once be recognized by the casual observer. But there was hardly a city that Mr. Moody visited during the remaining 25 years of his evangelistic career where he did not come across those who had first come to knowledge of Christ in the old Pennsylvania freight depot of Philadelphia or in the Hippodrome in New York in the winter of 1875-76. The following testimony of a New York pastor, written 20 years later, is but one of many that Mr. Moody frequently received. It has been said by some of the pastors of the more wealthy churches in the city that but little permanent good resulted in their churches from the series of meetings held by you in the city in 1876. This may be true so far as the churches named are concerned, but it is certainly not true regarding my own church. In 1876, there were nearly 139 persons. Of this number, 121 came on confession of their faith in Christ, and the larger part of them were brought to Christ directly through the influence of the great revival meetings in that year. These converts have worn well. Only a very small percentage have fallen away. Never since that day have we received so large a number in any one year. The greatest blessing that could come to the city at this time would be such a work as it was then carried on so successfully. What the city needs more than anything else is the preaching of the old gospel. It has lost none of its power. All substitutes have failed, and it is time to come back to the simple preaching of the gospel of the cross of Christ. You are doing a great work in Cooper Union and in Carnegie Hall now. And may God bless you and encourage you, and give you more and more at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Life of D.L. Moody, Chapter 25, Chicago and Boston It was not till the fall of 1876, and after the missions in Brooklyn, Philadelphia, and New York, that Mr. Moody again visited Chicago to conduct a special evangelistic campaign there. A large tabernacle had been erected for the occasion, with a seating capacity of over 10,000. Ministers who had known Mr. Moody in earlier years gave their hearty support to the work, and it was most gratifying for him to feel that. In his case, at least, it could not be said that a prophet is without honor in his own country. In Chicago, Mr. Moody was better known than in any city in the world, 
and in the mission begun in October 1876, he received the heartiest cooperation of clergy and laity he had ever known. It was during the Chicago mission in 1876 that Mr. Moody sustained the loss of a warm personal friend, as well as of an invaluable helper, in the sudden death of Mr. P.P. P. Bliss. Although comparatively a young man, Mr. Bliss's name was a familiar one in each Sunday school in America, and the Moody Sankey hymn book owed much of its original popularity to his contributions. A musical genius of unusual promise, he had been willing to sacrifice his taste for higher lines of composition to write music that would prove effectual in carrying the gospel message to the greatest numbers. As a hymn writer, as well as a composer, he was equally successful. As Hallelujah, what a Savior! More holiness give me, I know not what awaits me, and wonderful words of life testify. His personality was most lovable, and the strong attachment between him and Mr. Moody made the bereavement a deep one. Mr. and Mrs. Bliss had been spending Christmas with their family in Tonawanda, and were on their way to join Mr. Moody in Chicago, when they met death by a railroad accident, their train crashing through the Ashtabula Bridge and falling 70 feet into the river below. Mr. Moody never ceased to miss their aid in his work, and often spoke in warmest appreciation of their beautiful ministry. The Chicago Mission of 1876 was not only attended with manifest and sustained interest, but resulted in a material increase in church membership. For Mr. Moody never failed to urge the immediate affiliation of young converts with some regular church, and devotion to the strengthening of existing Christian agencies. At the close of the mission, a farewell service was held for those who professed to have been brought to Christ during the mission, for which admission was secured by ticket only. Applications were made for 6,000 of these tickets, and before the meeting closed, local churches reported over 2,000 accessions on profession of faith. Of late, critics have occasionally intimated that Mr. Moody no longer received the same cordial support in Chicago that characterized the earlier missions of 20 years ago. When, therefore, in 1897, it was announced that Mr. Moody was to conduct a series of meetings in the auditorium, the largest hall in the city, with accommodation for 6,000, many asserted that he would be unable to fill the hall mornings and afternoons. Mr. H. R. Lowry, representing the Chicago Times-Herald, thus describes the meetings at this later date. It made a scene without precedent. A preacher on the platform said it was like nothing so much as the host which sat at the foot of the mountain for the model sermon. Six thousand more men and women were standing in the streets after the management had ordered the doors closed. This multitude would not accept the announcement that the vast hall was packed from ceiling to pit. It swept around the corners and in the avenues until traffic was blocked. The cable cars could not get past. They insisted that there must be a mistake as there had never been any prayer meeting in Chicago since Moody went away, when there had not been room for more people than cared to attend. A line of policemen tried to argue, but the crowd would not be reasoned with. An hour before the time for opening, there had been a stampede. The men at the entrance were swept from their post by the tide. The overflow waited patiently during the service, and a small fraction of it was able to get inside after Mr. Moody had finished his sermon, and Mr. Moody started the call for volunteers in the service. Mr. Moody was one of the first men on the stage in the morning session, pacing up and down the front. He saw the throng pouring in. Hundreds of singers were coming through the back entrance and climbing into places in the tiers of seats, which ran back like the sides of a pyramid. He gave orders like a general. There must be a good beginning. He said a good beginning meant half the battle. He urged the choir to sing as if it meant it. He did not want any lagging. The organist made the organ thunder. He told the two hundred preachers who sat on the stage they were there for work, not for dignity. He was going to turn the battery towards Sinai. Chicago was always dear to Mr. Moody's heart, and here he always counted on the sympathy of many friends. As in 1876 and in 1897, the same cordial welcome always waited for him in the city of his earlier Christian activities. On the close of the Chicago campaign, Moody began a mission in Boston that in many respects presented peculiar difficulties. The hub of New England's culture and refinement is the center of every new philosophy and fad, while materialism and rationalism are widely spread. The idea of a revival in Boston was repugnant to many people and on many sides he was subjected to hostile criticism and false reports, often of a personal nature. But if he experienced strong opposition from such sources, he received, on the other hand, no less hearty support from others. Among these were many who became his confidential advisors in later projects, including, among others, Mr. Henry M. Moore, than whom Moody had no more valued supporter or close friend, Mr. Henry Durant, whose counsel was of such great value in the founding of the Northfield Schools, and Dr. A.J. Gordon, whose assistance in the Northfield Conferences was of an estimable value. In Boston, as in Chicago, a large temporary building was erected for the mission, with a seating capacity of 6,000. A representative committee of prominent ministers and laymen of all denominations supported the work, and from the first great interest was shown. 
The following appreciation of the Boston work was given at the close of the mission by Dr. Joseph Cook in prefacing one of his Monday lectures. It will always stand uncontrovertibly that a structure which holds from 6,000 to 7,000 people has been opened in Boston for religious audiences, and that week after week, for two months, on every fair day, and often twice or thrice a day, when an undiluted Christianity has been proclaimed there, this building was filled to copious overflowing. What other cause would have filled it as often and as long? This is the large question which Edinburgh, London, Chicago, and San Francisco will ask. As a help to an interior view of Massachusetts and its capital, it is not improper for me to state what the evangelists themselves could not, perhaps with propriety say publicly, that their notion is that in Boston, the average result of their work has been better than it was in Edinburgh. In one particular, this revival certainly surpasses that under Whitfield in this city in 1740, namely, in the extent to which the press has been enlisted in the work of sending religious truth abroad. All the leading respectable newspapers of Boston have favored the revival. In the next place, it deserves to be mentioned that religious visitation from house to house, and especially among the perishing and degraded, is now going forward in a hopeful manner in this city. And we have yet to speak of the prayer meetings among the businessmen, which have not yet attained the height of their influence. Let me mention, as a fourth prominent result of this revival, the great effort made for temperance. We have done more in that particular than was done in Boston and Whitfield's day, for in his time men were not awake to that theme. The five missions conducted in Brooklyn, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, and Boston during the years 1875, 1876, and 1877 may be properly termed the beginning of an evangelistic mission in America, covering a period of over 20 years. To recount the hundreds of cities visited, not only in the United States but in Canada, and extending even to Mexico, would be very largely a repetition of previous incidents and methods of work. North, south, east, and west, Mr. Moody visited all the leading cities of the continent. In some cases, he devoted an entire winter to work along evangelistic lines and in Bible readings among Christians. This was the case in Baltimore, St. Louis, and San Francisco, in each of which he stayed from five to six months. Often his missions would close with a short convention for Christians, the purpose being to awaken a greater interest in church work and evangelistic effort. And there would always be the same earnest appeal to young converts to do what they could to show their gratitude in working for the church. In later years, Mr. Moody was often criticized for devoting so much time and energy in preaching to Christians. His special gift, it was asserted, was to evangelize, and it was unwise for him to turn from the unconverted masses to try to arouse Christians. Others claim that the earlier missions had not left a permanent result in the communities, where they had apparently aroused greatest interest and had the largest audience. This twofold criticism could have been refuted readily had anyone accompanied him to any town in which he had ever before been engaged in sustained effort. His repeated experience was that, in any average church or hall in such places, many who had been led to Christ through his ministry, or Christians who had been themselves helped or had had relatives converted under Mr. Moody, would constitute a large portion of the audience. They would come early in the place of meetings and take the nearest seats, and those for whom he specially sought to preach the gospel would be either crowded out or find places only in a remote part of the hall. Thus, his very success in God's work became, in many places, an actual hindrance to preaching the gospel to those who had never accepted Christ. It was for the same reason that Mr. Moody was frequently unable to conduct an inquiry meeting. Although firmly believing in personal dealing, he was confronted in many places with the twofold difficulty of being unable to secure efficient Christian workers, sufficiently familiar with God's word to lead inquiring souls to the Master, and the interruptions he would be subjected to himself when dealing personally with those who wanted his help. On such occasions, it would often seem more like a testimony meeting than an inquiry room, as one after another would come forward to tell Mr. Moody had they been led to Christ through him during some former mission. Even in cities remote from the scenes of earlier missions, he would receive these testimonies. During his last extended tour on the Pacific coast in the winter of 1899, he was continually meeting those who had dated the Christian life from missions he had conducted years before in some city in the eastern states or in Great Britain. For these reasons, Mr. Moody was always looking for new fields, and on the tour just mentioned, he accepted invitations to the newly settled towns of Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. After spending a number of weeks in Denver and Colorado Springs, he began a series of short missions in places he had never before visited. In some of these, there was little support to be counted on, as the Christian portion of the population was inconsiderable among the large number of fortune seekers attracted to the country solely by the idea of money-making or adventure. But here he doubled his energies and was richly rewarded. Speaking of the difficulties in this work, he said, Last fall, I prayed God to send me to a hard field, and he answered my prayer. But difficulties were always an incentive to work harder in his case, and he spoke longingly of the possibilities of a longer mission than he was then able to make in these places. His work was more than once successful in bringing a prodigal to himself. 
in one town in the new country. He received a hurriedly written note from a wanderer after a sermon on repentance, stating that he had left the service that night during the sermon, convicted of his sin, and was leaving by the midnight train for his home in Philadelphia, to seek his parents' pardon for his cruel treatment and desertion. Striking, as is the impression produced by great bodies of men yielding to a common emotion, there is something almost equally forcible in these picturesque individual incidents. In reading accounts of thousands turned away from crowded halls, and of thousands converted by certain definite missions, one is liable to forget that these crowds were all made up of single souls, and that men are gained one by one. Mr. Moody was much given to the man-to-man -man method. He was especially interested in the inquiry room, and always laid great stress on the necessity for competent helpers in this work. Let every one of us try to get one soul was his constant appeal. And how many he won personally in this way cannot possibly be estimated. Nor, indeed, did he care to estimate them. He was intolerant of that kind of statistics. When a minister recently asked him how many souls had been saved in his preaching, he answered, I don't know anything about that, doctor. Thank God I don't have to. I don't keep the Lamb's Book of Life. In reviewing the work of these months and comparing the missions held in Great Britain and in America, Professor W. D. McKenzie said recently, It is a strange fact, and one that strikes a kind of awe into the soul whenever it is contemplated afresh, that Mr. Moody's career of evangelism reached its height in America during a period of extraordinary material prosperity, and in Great Britain during a period of extraordinary intellectual skepticism and religious depression, the two conditions most hostile to faith. In the face of the claims of the world, he preached the claims of the living God and his gospel. He went from end to end of this land, calling multitudes away from mere earthliness of interest and from the greed of wealth and prosperity, to the problem of individual salvation and the concerns of everlasting life. In England, he found himself in communities where philosophy and science had almost tied the tongues of many preachers and had chilled the devotion of multitudes of the most intelligent classes. He did not attempt to reconcile science and religion, nor to meet the terrific onslaught of a revolutionary philosophy upon the Christian faith. Simply and powerfully and in the Holy Spirit, he preached the gospel, and compelled an amazed people to see that the might of that gospel is as unquestionable and divine as ever. Moody's work was one of the most powerful influences in stemming the tide of doubt which was flowing over England in the 70s. In Scotland he rendered the same service, and also another, for vast portions of Scotland have remained invincibly Christian. But the Christianity of those days was stiff and formal, severe and ungenial. Few churches used hymnals, and fewer still had organs. The established church had begun to recover popularity, and its empty buildings were beginning to fill. But it lacked the warmth of true evangelism. The free church had lost most of its fervent and brilliant leaders of earlier days, and a new class of men was growing up, scholarly and powerful, but again inclined to formality of preaching, and many doubted. To learn more about God's peculiar people, visit the links in the description.